Welcome everyone. We are so glad to have you here for the first ever event of the Reconnected webinar series on important topics relating to micronutrients. And this is a follow-up from the Micronutrient Forum's fifth global conference, also referred to as Connected. My name is Lisa Rogers and I'll be serving as a moderator for this webinar today. I'm joining you from the World Health Organization in Geneva, where I've been working for the past 15 years. And I'm very much devoted to these uh, tiny little nutrients that are so vital for good health and well-being. We have really made some progress over the years in reducing some of the micronutrient deficiencies, but we still have a ways to go. And I really believe that our collective efforts of the micronutrient community are really needed now more than ever. So I'm really excited that today we get to talk about two micronutrients that have been on the top of the global health agenda for some time now, vitamin A and zinc. And in fact, it's one of my very first assignments at WHO was to develop the global estimates of vitamin A deficiency. So that was uh, quite some time ago, but today we get to uh, learn a little bit uh, about the newer and hot off the press work around the prevalence and disease burden of deficiencies for both vitamin A and zinc. So we're really excited for this webinar today. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, the session today will be recorded and it'll be shared um, shortly on YouTube. So uh, we really need to make sure that we're all behaving ourselves today. Um, there will be one question and answer session at the end of the webinar. And so if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a Q&A button. And we encourage you to submit your questions for the speakers in this Q&A um, section here. And then also you'll have the opportunity to upvote any questions that you see posted that you think um, are really of high priority and that you would like to hear answered as well. We'll try to answer as many of those questions as possible um, within the session. Um, and also before we get started, I really wanted to say a, a very big thank you to the Micronutrient Forum for hosting this event and for also just really being a, a real leader and bringing awareness to the importance of data and alleviating some of the micronutrient deficiencies. Um, this, is, this is very much needed. So um, we're very thankful to the Micronutrient Forum and all their efforts to do this. So it's now my pleasure to, um, to start the webinar and we're gonna start with what's called a fireside chat or pretty much for those of you in warmer climates, just think of this as a nice lakeside chat. And um, I would like to involve or invite two really wonderful um, panelists who will bring a wealth of information uh, to us. They have a, a lot of experience in micronutrients and they will be able to share some of their insights into the micronutrient deficiencies through just a, a nice little short discussion that we have today. So first I would like to welcome the executive director of the Micronutrient Forum, uh, Dr. Saskia Ossendorf. And she has been with us um, or has a little over more than 20, 25 years of experience in international nutrition research, both in the public and private sectors. And she's also been a visiting associate professor in nutrition and health at Wigan University. During her career, she has spent some time in Bangladesh working for ICDDRB, um, followed by time as a lead scientist in micronutrients and child nutrition at Unilever. Saskia has also worked as an independent consultant for international NGOs, academia, and research institutes. And also would like to give a very warm welcome to Sonia Hess. Um, she's joining us from very sunny California. Sonia is a research nutritionist in the Institute of Global Nutrition at the University of California, Davis. She completed her master's degree in food science engineering and received a PhD in human nutrition from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. She has worked in human nutrition research, um, primarily focusing on interactions among different trace elements and the control of micronutrient deficiencies in many different low, um, in low income countries. So Sonia is also leading the micronutrient research work stream at the Micronutrient Forum. So both uh, Saskia and Sonia, it's, it's really great to have you here with us. Um, and uh, to get our little conversation started, I would first like to um, pose a question to Saskia. Saskia, can you share with us why you feel it is important to estimate the prevalence and disease burden of micronutrient deficiencies? Yes, thank you, Lisa. And it's great to, uh, to be here today at our first uh, Reconnected webinar. Um, so yeah, I think we, we know that micronutrients, uh, vitamin A and zinc that are the topic of today's webinar, but also other micronutrients, including iron, folic acid, 
vitamin B12, calcium, thiamine, riboflavin, they're all essential for optimal growth and cognitive development, for survival, for a good immune response and resistance against infectious diseases. And deficiencies in these micronutrients are known to have uh, immediate, but also long lasting effects also on uh, adult productivity, economic productivity and chronic disease risk later in life. Um, and we also know that worldwide many people suffer from micronutrient deficiencies and we do have cost effective, ready to scale solutions at hand. Uh, including the promotion of healthy diets, uh, promotion of breastfeeding, uh, biofortification, food fortification, and micronutrient supplementation. And yet we are not making sufficient progress in addressing micronutrient malnutrition. And this has become uh, very clear again um, in the Lancet series on maternal and child undernutrition that were uh, published uh, and launched uh, early last month in March. And that really uh, confirmed and showed that we have virtually made no progress in the reduction of maternal anemia in the last two decades. And the Lancet series also identified uh, that uh, the, one of the barriers to progress is this fast micronutrient data gap that exists. And this is particularly on micronutrient status data and particularly on data in women. And we know that having timely access um, to status and program data is really essential for evidence informed um, policy making. So um, to design context specific mix of interventions to target the population's highest in need and to monitor progress. So really this gap in, uh, in status data prevents accurate mapping of the global burden of micronutrient deficiencies. And um, therefore we rely now on other methodologies such as the ones that will be discussed in today's webinar. And, and I think that's why it's so critical to address this issue um, and to, and to to discuss on, on alternative methodologies as well as how can we generate more and more data in today's webinar. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Saskia. And I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, if we start to think about all the different micronutrient deficiencies and especially in the context of COVID, you know, we, we start to really understand how important it is to, to always make sure that we do have this, this nice baseline adequacy and, and how important it is for everyday life. And um, and speaking of maternal anemia, we just released, uh, WHO just released the new estimates of um, global prevalence of anemia just uh, earlier this week. And, and we do, we, we see very little progress, uh, especially in women of reproductive age. And so it is, it highlights a, a very big need for us. So, so thank you very much for sharing those insights. So Sonia, I'd like to um, come over to you now and um, ask you if maybe you could share with us and describe some of the key research that has already been done in the area of micronutrient status assessment and where you feel um, there's more work that still needs to be done in this area. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Great to be with you today. Um, relevant for today's webinar is the research around micronutrient status assessment. And so the question is, which biomarker is most reliable to identify people who are who have iodine, um, micronutrient deficiencies, so iodine, zinc, vitamin A, and what cutoffs um, are associated with adverse health outcomes and functional outcomes. And so the most recent papers on this uh, have been the Bond papers that I would encourage people to read that review uh, specific micronutrients with public health uh, significance on which micronutrient is, uh, which biomarker is important. And so, uh, I also agree with Saskia, there's more micronutrients that are important for public health. We just don't really have information on which biomarker are useful, or we don't even have a cutoff um, to, to define a deficiency. So really more research is needed on that. Another relevant area is the area, of, especially with vitamin A and zinc, but also iron status, is on how infection impacts these biomarkers. And their research that has been um, published recently and is still going on is done by the research, bring the research group and how we can adjust these biomarkers for the presence of infection. Then another point that I think is also very important is the laboratory assessment comparison, because if you switch a, a method from one survey to five years later, you no longer know what, how those two compare. So we really need to understand how different laboratory analysis and techniques compare. And moving forward, I think what would be really helpful is um, when we could avoid cold chain, like we, if, we, if there's a ways of uh, having reliable and easy accessible um, measures with the dry blood spots, for example, or even 
point of care devices, rapid tests to assess a micronutrient status, China light to know anemia status. Um, you know, these are things that would make data collection so much easier and probably would allow us to collect more of that missing data. And I think one, uh, maybe you could tell us more about what's going on right now since you're in the middle of an anemia uh, reassessment of the cutoff of hemoglobin. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, you know, you're right. You know, the data that is needed to establish these cutoffs are, are really important. And, and right now, WHO is embarking on a, a few years long now process to really start to evaluate the hemoglobin thresholds to define anemia. And so we're bringing together uh, many different groups who are looking at um, the, the way that we can assess the, the cutoffs and generate the cutoffs from, from different angles, you know, from just a purely statistical approach to really having uh, data looking at the functional outcomes of, of hemoglobin levels and the consequences of that. So really, it, it's been very exciting to bring together all the different research and all the different, you know, methodologies that we can, um, you know, just to try and, and see if we can better have a better assessment of those. And I think, you know, anemia is, uh, hemoglobin anemia is not the only one. We, we still have a long way to go with um, other biomarkers like vitamin D that we really need some, some consensus, consensus on going forward too. So we hope to um, wrap up the uh, hemoglobin um, concentration levels and probably early 2022. So we hope to have some, some much better uh, information for everyone coming out, but, um, it's, it's really uh, very exciting work and, it, and it's great to see all the different researchers coming together to, to look at that. Um, but now I'd like to turn it back to Saskia and see if you can just help us to understand a little bit more about the micronutrient forms role in helping to fill some of the data gaps because we know a lot of uh, initiatives are going on right now. So we'd like to hear a little bit more about those. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, of course, uh, as a independent knowledge hub and global convener in the area of, um, of micronutrient nutrition, this micronutrient data gap um, is really um, um, on, on top of our concerns. And I think uh, the Micronutrient Forum is therefore playing a role by bringing, creating awareness and bringing stakeholders to get together to collectively address uh, the micronutrient data gap. And, and um, one thing that we did uh, last year or the, la the last one and a half year is that the forum convened a working group that was led by Ken Brown, and it has developed a strategic plan uh, that systematically first identified the gaps in the data generation value chain, and then proposed solutions. And this plan has now been published and can be found as a report on, uh, on our website. And a summary of the plan is in, uh, uh, currently in press uh, for publication in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and will be, will be available very soon. And this plan also includes the intention of the stakeholders to include, uh, to launch a micronutrient data generation initiative um, that, that uh, in collaboration with, uh, with academic pro, uh, program implementation people, people working in the governments and NGOs and other partners um, to, to address uh, this issue. And as you also mentioned, the, the forum also plays an important role and we, we're serious about this role, about the uh, creati creation of awareness among the stakeholders and among countries and among donors and others on the importance of having adequate micronutrient data um, to, in order to make progress here. And today's Reconnected webinar is an example of how we do this. And in addition, during the Connected Micronutrient Conference last November, we also had sessions on micronutrient data and uh, these sessions are still available uh, for everyone. They're free um, to access and you can watch them and learn from them and also disseminate them uh, among your uh, among your network. Now um, we are also collaborating on a joint food systems data game changer that is currently in development as part of the preparations for the uh, United Nations Food Systems Summit. And we know, uh, and, and this is uh, I think timely to include micronutrient data in there because we know that uh, healthy diets that are rich in micronutrients um, are the ultimate outcome of sustainable healthy food systems. Uh, but currently, the micronutrient data gap is really limiting uh, uh, and our ability to measure progress um, for in food systems transformations. And I think that's why we really have to make sure that this is being tackled and it's being tackled in an integrated way. And uh, we hope that today's webinar may be um, one way for uh, everyone to learn more about the need to, uh, to have uh, reliable data on micronutrients and also on um, yeah, just learn more about how these data are being uh, 
are being compiled by institutes such as the uh, um, IHME. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Saskia. And it would be uh, so wonderful to chat more and more, but uh, we really need to, to keep moving forward. And we're really grateful for all the work that all the researchers are doing and for the work of the Micronutrient Forum in this area. I think that's how we're really going to keep moving forward. And just a, a real personal thank you to Saskia and Sonia for their dedication and work in nutrition. Um, I'm really looking forward to being part of this progress to tackle the data gap in nutrition. And uh, so we're, we're really looking forward to the future as well. So now it would be my pleasure to introduce um, Ashkan Afshin, um, who is presenting on the methods um, used for both the 2017 and 2019 Global Burden of Disease Studies. So this will be our first presentation that focused specifically on the results of vitamin A and zinc deficiency. Now, Ashkan is an assistant professor of global health at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, or IHME at the University of Washington. And in this role, he works on the Global Burden of Disease Project, leading the effort to estimate the disease burden attributable to lifestyle risk factors. He's also a physician and epidemiologist with formal training from Tufts, Harvard, Tehran University, as well as John Hopkins. And he has experience um, and expertise in health policy, population health, um, decision sciences, public health informatics, and health economics as well. So Ashkan, I'd like to turn the floor over to you and we look forward to your presentation. Great, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, Hello everyone, it's a pl great pleasure uh, to be here today and thanks uh, Micronutrient Forum for the opportunity to present our work uh, in the global burden of disease on micronutrient uh, deficiency. Uh, so before I start, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our team at IHME and our colleague, Dr. Joseph schmidt Haber at, uh, at UNFAO. Also, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, more than thousands of uh, GBD collaborator in this project and also the support of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for our work. Over the next about 20 minutes, I'm going to provide you with an overview of nutritional risk factors uh, in GBD. And also I would uh, provide more detailed information about the process of estimating burden of disease related to vitamin A deficiency and zinc deficiency. Also, I would like to compare some of the changes that we have made and some of the updates that we have made in the most recent cycle of GBD that is published GBD 2019 and compare them to uh, the result that was published previously as a part of GBD 2017. Uh, so before I start and go uh, into the details, I would like as a reminder for all of us, uh, as mentioned uh, in the first part of this webinar, there are a number of challenges when it comes to the nutritional risk factors and most spe more specifically micronutrient deficiencies. So basically, we know that data on the uh, prevalence of micronutrient deficiency, uh, essentially they are limited and scattered. Not all of them are public in the public domain and are not publicly available. Uh, there's also inconsistencies in data collection within the country across different sources and also across different countries. Also, for some micronutrients and also uh, and uh, disease, uh, there are some uh, um, basically inconsistency in the epidemiologic evidence, and this result in a large between a study heterogeneity and also lack of consensus among various experts about how strong is the evidence on the health effect of various micronutrient uh, deficiencies. And these are the challenges that uh, is basically comparable to other sec sections of the base health data that we have. And in IHME and the global burden of disease, we develop a set of principles and solutions that we try to uh, consistently apply to all, all risk factors, including nutritional risk factors. So essentially our approach here is that we identify system, we, uh, every year we try to do a systematic effort to identify all relevant data sources. Then we try to standardize them, what we call it crosswalking across various sources. We generally consider one type of source as a gold standard. 
and correct the biases for other uh, basically data sources accordingly. Uh, then we go through the estimation process. We generate full time series in each cycle of GBD. Of course, in some countries uh, and in some years we have more data. In those cases, we have less uncertainty in our estimates. And in some cases we have basically little data or no data. And our estimates is uh, mostly based on the modeling exercise in those cases. And in those cases, we also have a larger uncertainty in our estimates. Then uh, one of the key areas uh, as a part of quality assessment, we make sure that the data that we are generated are consi internally consistent in terms of the time trend and also age pattern of the estimation process. And as I mentioned, this is essentially annual iterative effort. And uh, this gives me opportunity to incorporate new data as they become available and also develop new method uh, to improve our estimation process. Here you can see essentially the, all the risk factors that are nutritional risk factors that are related, included in GBD. These are based on the most recent published result of the GBD, GBD 2019. We are currently finalizing GBD 2020, which will be published soon as well. Uh, as you can see, uh, basically the ranking of micronutrients of interest that we are focusing in this session, uh, both vitamin A and uh, basically zinc deficiency, they rank eight and 10 among the all nutritional risk factors. And over the last uh, three decades, uh, their basically ranking has remained constant. So essentially, if I want to categorize the risk factor or nutritional risk factors at all uh, that we have assessed and included in GBD, we can categorize them in three major categories. There are a number of uh, nutritional risk factors that we can, we have good level of data and we can estimate them consistently with little uncertainty. The second category of the basically risk factors are the risk factors for which we have some data, which allows us to do some estimation. But of course, here, uh, basically we have wide uncertainty in our estimation. And there are a number of risk factors that there is, data is so little that we cannot generate any estimates. So examples of the first group are essentially mostly uh, risk factors such as the stunting and wasting that you saw in the previous slide. They have good data, good coverage, time and geographical coverage, and generally we have little uncertainty and uh, year to year variation in our estimates of GBD. The second category, those are uh, basically risk factors for which we have some data, including vitamin A deficiency and zinc deficiency but both in terms of the quality of the data, time trend of the data, and geographical uh, uh, coverage of the data, they are much more limited compared to the first group. So in those, although we are estimating them, our estimates have larger uncertainty. And we have essentially, uh, between different cycles, as we make improvement, there are some changes uh, in some countries, depending on the basic improvements that we make. And the third category are essentially the risk factors that we don't have enough data to estimate them. An example of these groups are uh, risk factors such as vitamin D deficiency and thiamine deficiency. Of course, we are uh, monitoring the data that they become available. And once we have sufficient data, we start to estimate these risk factors as well. This slide shows essentially the GBD risk factor estimation process. Uh, we call this framework as a company, uh, as a a comparative risk assessment framework. And as you can see, you start from the left. The first step is that we need to define what we mean by micronutrient deficiency. Then after defining micronutrient deficiency, we need to estimate the prevalence of micronutrient deficiency in each country, age, sex, uh, and uh, basically year. And then we also need to know what is the health effect of micronutrient deficiency? What is the relative risk of micronutrient deficiency for incidence or prevalence? of a disease endpoint. So for example, what is the incidence uh, relative risk or mortality relative risk for vitamin A deficiency and diarrhea or lower respiratory tract infection? Using these two inputs, we calculate population attributable fraction or what we call it PAF, which is the proportion of disease that could have been prevented if there has been no uh, vitamin A deficiency or no micronutrient deficiency. And then by multiplying the path to the basically disease specific burden, we estimate the attributable disease burden. And that is the basic data that is 
generally estimated each year of the GBD and we make them publicly available through our GBD compare uh, visualization tool. Now let's focus on the first step of the process, defining macronutrient deficiencies. Essentially, uh, from the rest of the presentation, I'll focus only on the vitamin A and zinc deficiency. When it comes to defining micronutrient uh, deficiency in here, vitamin A and zinc deficiency, we can define them based on dietary intake, sometimes it's also called dietary adequacy. Uh, we can define them based on a biomarker level, and generally there is some uh, basically a strong argument to make that this might be the most accurate level for uh, essentially measuring these risk factors. Uh, and then there are other ways to and basically define them based on their uh, basically clinical symptoms or even uh, treat them as a cause of death. And in this, uh, when we start defining these in the risk factor section of GBD, we actually go our main limiting factor is that for which we have reliable data that we can use. So essentially for vitamin A, we have reliable data, the relatively good coverage, of course, it needs to be improved for serum retinol levels. So we use biomarker for defining vitamin A deficiency, but then it comes to zinc deficiency, we have very limited data. So we use dietary data for which we think we have, we can generate more reliable estimates for zinc deficiency. And this difference by itself has implication in terms of how much essentially burden and prevalence we estimate. Let me just give you a, a little bit more information on this topic. So this slide shows basically the relationship between the, the uh, basically intake level and efficiency level uh, based on dietary intake and essentially the uh, biomarker level. The x-axis shows the rank of the individual based on the uh, basically dietary intake of vitamin A. These data are data from NHANES and you can see that in two separate age and sex group to show that the consistency of the result. And the y-axis shows the rank of the individual in the biomarker distribution. And we don't see any correlation. Essentially, when you take a look at the rank of the individual, some people have very high rank in the basically distribution of the biomarker, but very low rank in the dietary intake. And uh, this is basically uh, give us that uh, this indication that depending on the uh, basically definition that we use, some people might be ranked, uh, might be categorized as deficient, others might be not. And this has major implication in terms of how we estimate the burden of disease and who are the good at risk group that we identify. This is the kind of similar type of uh, figures and it uh, basically compared, uh, make the same comparison based on zinc deficiency on two different age and sex group. Again, no correlation between the rank of individual in the distribution of intake versus the distribution of biomarker. The second factor that is important when it comes to essentially defining the macronutrient deficiency is that uh, basically we get different, we have different cutoffs and also we have different shape of a distribution. And this also give us different uh, estimates of the prevalence. So these are the same groups of people, micro data that has been used to create these two distribution for zinc deficiency. On the left, you can see the distribution based on a serum zinc level. And on the right, you can see the data from dietary intake of zinc. And you can see if we go with the definition of uh, serum zinc level to define macronutrient deficiency, we get about 10% deficiency. And if we go with the uh, basically dietary intake level in the same group, same people, we get about uh, 63 uh, basically uh, percent deficiency. And this is another implication that how we define macronutrient deficiency. Uh, the estimates that we get and the burden that we have is very different. So it's important, I wanted to highlight that before we go to the comparison of the burden that we have for zinc deficiency and vitamin A deficiency, because as you saw at the beginning, we had, because of data availability, we use different approach for defining them. So the next step of the process is defining the, uh, basically, uh, or estimating the deficiency prevalence. This slide is a kind of simplified version of our estimation process, I know it's, uh, still complicated. So I just want to draw your attention to three different areas. On the left, 
we start the process by different data sources, including the most important data source that we have used in the past cycles of GBD, WHO, vitamin and mineral database. Uh, we also use World Bank data to get the data for supplementation. We first start the process by generating the full time series of the vitamin A supplementation. Then we use this vitamin A supplementation in our modeling approach to as, uh, and we use it as a covariate or predictor to help us predict the data for the countries that we don't have enough data. So this slide shows a map of data that have been used in GBD. As I mentioned, the main source of these data come from WHO micronutrient database. As you can see, uh, you can see the geographical patterns of the data availability. We had data for uh, 272 location years representing 96 countries. And also for uh, a third of those, more than a third of those countries, we have more than three data points that allows us to capture the time trend of the data. And generally they represent 20 out of 21 regions that we have in GBD. One of the challenges that we have in addition to the basically countries that we don't have data in GBD, we estimate, uh, generate estimate for more, for about 200 uh, countries or for half of the countries, there is no data available. And also another point here is that most of the data that exists here is for before year 2010. So a recent data is also uh, not very much available. Uh, we have made systematic effort through both collaboration with the WHO team and also internally at IHME to do uh, basically systematic identification of data sources. We have identified a lot of data sources that is currently going under the extraction and we are hoping to incorporate in the future cycles of GBD. This figure shows an idea uh, of the basically uh, the data on the supplementation. As I mentioned, this comes from the World Bank database on vitamin A supplementation. Uh, and we have data for 94 countries, uh, more than 1,000 location year. And on supplementation, we have data on uh, recent years as well, specifically as you can see, close to 500 location years of the data uh, is related to the last decade, which gives us basically more confidence in estimating the uh, supplementation. But as you can see, uh, almost all of these data come from low and middle income country and not necessarily from high income countries. Uh, as I mentioned, in each cycle of GBD, uh, we go through this uh, process of estimation, we share our result and we go through the expert consultation and collaborator consultation and we receive a lot of feedback in each uh, cycle and we try to incorporate them as much as possible. So when we published GBD 2017, we received a number of uh, feedback from uh, basically GBD collaborators and so great colleagues who are in this panel. Uh, and we try to incorporate them as much as possible. Here is some of the critiques and issues that we had with GBD 2017 estimates. So for example, uh, some of these were uh, focused on the vitamin A supplementation covariate. Uh, one of the critiques was that at the GBD 2017, we consider it as the all age covariate, while we know that supplementation program mostly impact uh, and target young children. So use it as all age might dilute the effect. Also, the, we, we had generated the full time size of vitamin A supplementation. This goes all the way back to the 1990, but we know that the uh, uh, vitamin A supplementation campaign generally started basically in the late 1990. And before that, uh, there was not such a basically, this covariate might not have a good predictive power. And another issue was that essentially, we are expecting to see that uh, there is an inverse relationship between, in terms of prediction between uh, vitamin A supplementation and vitamin A deficiency. But the data didn't show that at least there was a positive relationship. And that was another point that was lacked for us to evaluate and investigate. And also the final time train that we generate it was not expected with the prior knowledge of people that in some countries, in terms of the time train, in most countries it was mostly flat, but the expectation is specific some countries that we see a declining trend. So with that in mind, we made a number of changes in our basic estimation process. Uh, First, we, for supplementation, we change our estimation machinery. We use from another uh, one machinery called DISMOD, uh, which is a Bayesian hierarchical, uh, basically a meta regression uh, tool to another one, which is again also Bayesian and hierarchical tool, but 
uh, this mod has a great uh, ability in identifying the age uh, pattern, but not but has some weakness in characterizing the time trend. But SDGPR, spatial temporal Gaussian regression, has the ability to better characterize the time trend. We also assign the supplementation data only to age group one to five. Then we, after estimation, we manually set zero uh, any supplementation data before year 1990 because of the points that I mentioned in the previous slide. And also for age group beyond age 15, uh, we essentially again didn't uh, use this covariate for estimation. And to generate the full time series, we use LDI, which is lag distributed income. Uh, as a uh, predictor, as you can see, there was an inverse relationship. The country, high income country essentially didn't have any supplementation program, mostly because they already have good intake and lower level of basically deficiency. Here you can see the updated uh, vitamin A supplementation, uh, cover, uh, basically coverage covariate that was generated. As you can see, higher in African countries and lower middle income countries and lower in the uh, most of the developed countries. Also, as a part of this process, uh, uh, we try to improve the time trend. And essentially, as you can see, the time trend of the data, these are by different super regions. And we now, for the countries and regions that we see, expecting the declining trend in the data, we saw that essentially in the data, including Sub Saharan Africa and South Asia, and in many of the high income countries, there, was, there hasn't been a large deficiency uh, basic prevalence and it continued to have that. Uh, and this is like essentially summarizes the uh, essentially the coefficient of covariate that we use in this model. In addition to vitamin A supplementation, we also use availability of the vitamin A at the population level. We use SDI, which is the socio-demographic index, which is a factor that take into account a, economic development, fertility, and education, and also prevalence of uh, or the risk associated with stunting as a covariate. As you can see, the most important predictor, both in male and female, were SDI and stunting. Also, we see the basically some correlation, uh, some predictive power for vitamin A supplementation and availability, but not as much as SDI and stunting. And it's important to note that still vitamin A supplementation, the relationship is positive. These are uh, basically estimate at the log space, the coefficient at the log space. And this is a light shows the basically the scatter plot of the GBD prevalence of deficiency versus supplementation. We don't see uh, for many countries essentially a very clear graph, uh, basically correlation. But if we organize or categorize countries across different regions, you may see some patterns. So for example, generally in African countries, this relationship is positive. Mostly, it's, we can call it maybe it's a reverse causation. Countries have higher prevalence, they uh, uh, the higher prevalence of deficiency. Essentially, they initiate uh, the supplementation and have a better coverage. So that's the reason that we see this positive correlation. We see this to the different level with a smaller slope for essentially for uh, South Asia countries. And as I mentioned, for high income countries, there is no relationship essentially because they don't have it. Uh, very powerful or high coverage of a micro supplementation program. Uh, in summary, for vitamin A deficiency, essentially uh, the critique that we have received, we improved the uh, essentially uh, vitamin A supplementation estimation process. We improved the time trend. We still have this positive relationship because of the issues that I mentioned to you. And also we tried to basically uh, update our uh, workflow and on the left, you can see the updated workflow based on the changes that we have made. And if you are interested to see the comparison of the GBD 2017 and 2019, the next slide give you an idea of how the data change. Each dot represents essentially a country. Uh, they are colored by different regions. The x-axis is GBD 2017 estimate, y-axis is GBD 2019 estimates. And essentially, you can see that in most countries we have declined. We have a lower estimates of the prevalence for the same year uh, compared to GB 2017. For some African countries, because of improving the covariate and better time trend, we also have the, uh, basically uh, higher estimates of the deficiency prevalence. This is on the essentially uh, the health uh, 
uh, prevalence estimation, we also improved the estimation of the relative risk. We did our systematic review of, and meta-analysis and we developed new method for meta-analyzing this data. Also in previous cycles of GBD, we were used to adjust for background prevalence uh, rate, uh, but when we uh, assessed them statistically, we didn't find any significant relationship between the background prevalence rate and the relative risk. So this year we didn't adjust them in GBD 2000. 19. So you can see there was a significant difference in the magnitude of the relative risk after incorporating these changes. And also we did not find significant relationship between vitamin A and lower respiratory rate, uh, lower respiratory rate infection. So we dropped them as a risk outcome for GBD. And this slide shows essentially the same thing, but the comparison uh, of the uh, basically Population attributable fraction, which is the measure of burden in GBD 2017 goes to GBD 2019. And because of the lower prevalence and also lower relative risk, this uh, cycle, we also have essentially lower estimates of the burden as well. Uh, quickly, over the next two minutes, I'm going to uh, over uh, the result that we have for zinc and then uh, conclude the presentation. Essentially, this is a simplified version of our estimation process for zinc deficiency. We start from estimating the dietary intake. For dietary intake, we use different data. We use availability of zinc based on a global nutrient database that we generated in, in close collaboration with uh, FAO and our colleague, Dr. Joseph schmidt Harbor. Then we use basic dietary recall for bias adjustment of the bias of those data. Then we characterize the full distribution. And after that, we estimate what is the prevalent and what, what proportion of the population has intake below the recommended level of intake. More data on our global nutrient database is available. We published it in the Lancet a few years ago. Uh, the critics that were related to zinc deficiency was essentially based on that why we are not using zinc uh, biomarker, specifically because of the lack of data that is available. And also how we adjust FAO data, it, has, it may have major implication for our final estimates. And we need, to, that's why we are every year we go through this, make sure that we have, we incorporate all the data in the estimation process. Also, uh, there was concern about the adjustment for background uh, deficiency rate and incorporating new data or data from new meta-analysis that we try to address. Uh, so, this slide shows the adjustment factor that we use for adjusting FAO data and FFQ data, food frequency questionnaire in our estimation process. Essentially, the data availability that we get, they are multiplied by these numbers for male and female to go to the intake. We also characterize the age distribution and apply it to these data to make sure that we have a good age pattern. And based on that and the standard deviation of intake, we create the whole distribution of intake uh, this slide shows a comparison of the changes that we have seen between GB 2017 and 19. Uh, Y-axis is GB 2019 and uh, essentially X-axis is GB 2017. Uh, we see some differences in different some locations because of the basically uh, improving modeling exercise for uh, some of these countries and also adjustment or uh, change in smart adjustment in basically uh, adjustment factor of uh, FAO data. But when it comes to the basic deficiency for some countries at the higher level, we see some changes. And it's mostly because in this high level of intake, when we shift the mean, uh, the tail of it, we see bigger changes in the tail of the distribution, specifically in the high income countries have a high level of intake, the small changes essentially in the mean can have huge impact on the tail, left tail of the distribution. And that's why you see these changes. Also on the relative risk, we updated our relative risk and we didn't adjust for background deficiency and that we also didn't find any relationship between zinc deficiency and uh, also lower respiratory tract infection. So that's why we dropped that. And this slide shows essentially the scatter plot of the GB 2017 estimate of population attributable fraction versus uh, essentially 2019 population attributable fraction. And finally, I want to highlight a few points from this presentation. As I mentioned, the method of defining, defining the micronutrient deficiency has major implication for estimating the burden of disease related to micronutrient deficiency. Data availability, accessibility, and quality of data are major barriers to accurately estimate the burden of disease 
related to macronutrient deficiencies. Uh, when it comes to the health effect, there are major and significant between a study heterogeneities in health effects. And when we incorporate them, some of these results become non-significant. And finally, estimating the burden of disease uh, related to macronutrient deficiency is a continuous and iterative process and requires harnessing new data and new methods as they become available. And that's what we are trying to do in the GBD. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. I'm happy to answer any question that we have uh, that you may have in the Q&A section. Great, thank you so much, Ashkan. That was a wonderful presentation and those methods behind the global burden of disease estimates are quite complex and we're really appreciative of you breaking those down for us and also describing some of the changes from 2017 to 2019. Um, we ask uh, everyone to don't hesitate to put any questions in the Q&A um, tab for uh, Ashkan uh, that we can get to in the Q&A session. Um, and to move right along, we'd also like to now move to Alexander McCain, McLean, sorry, and he will weigh in from the point of view of a biostatistician. And he'll suggest some ways forward on these uh, different global burden of disease estimates and the methodology behind them. Alex is a associate professor in epidemiology and biostatistics at the University of South Carolina. And he brings light to the complex topic of statistical methodological research. And uh, he has contributed to over 70 publications during his career. And he's worked at NIH's um, in National Institute of Health uh, or Child Health and Human Development. I'd like to turn the floor over to you, Alex, now. We look forward to your presentation. No, oh, thank you very much, Lisa. That's a very kind introduction and I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here with uh, um, a panel of, of such uh, great speakers who are so knowledgeable about this, uh, about this topic. Uh, to give you a little bit of background of how I came into this, uh, this field, so my, my research in, in nutrition kind of has two areas. One of them is, in, uh, is on the, the, the estimation side, so estimating, as, as you heard Ashkan talk about, the, the prevalence of, of some of the some of the risk factors. So I've done some some research in that, and then on the other side, uh, completing some, some some critical reviews and really looking in depth at the the, the global burden of disease uh, studies, which is really more of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, this will not be a technical talk. There's there's no formulas in this talk, which may be a first for me. Um, it's really going to be a, a high level overview of the global burden of disease and uh, really my view of, of how we can use this, um, this great project to, uh, to, to benefit um, uh, public health and, and to improve micronutrient uh, research. Um, so this is a, a breakdown of, of my talk. So start off with acknowledging the complexity of the problem from a very high level perspective. I think Ashkan's talked uh, a lot about these things, but um, just just putting them in a, a in my perspective, I guess. And, and through acknowledging the complexity, we, we get to the uncertainty that that's been mentioned as well. But but really valuing the uncertainty, um, uh, uncertainty in results is is not something I like. I don't want uncertainty in results, but just once we acknowledge the complexity of the process, we see that there is going to be uncertainty. And, and to, to uh, advocate for, 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 for that full view of the, of the estimates. And then finally, the, the need for transparency in the results. Um, I think this uh, webinar today is a, is a great start for that, but um, advocating for, for the participation in the transparency as well. So, so this slide here is, is very similar to, to one Ashkan had on uh, in his talk, just a very high level overview of the global burden of disease. So we start off with a risk factor, for example, vitamin A, we get risk factor levels um, for vitamin A, it just be, may be uh, deficient or not deficient like that. For some other risk factors, they're, they're more, uh, the, the levels may be moderate, severe, you know, for example. Um, then once we have that risk factor and the risk factor levels, we're gonna link uh, causes of death or disease endpoints uh, to that risk factor. So for vitamin A, that may be diarrhea. So it's, it's, there's the linking aspect and then quantifying how much risk is there when uh, extra risk is there when you are mic 
when you are vitamin A deficient versus, versus when you are not. The next step in the process, and one that I'll, I'll talk uh, about in some detail here, is the, the, the prevalence. So estimating the prevalence of the risk factor at each uh, location that we have in, in each year. And sometimes there's, there's subgroups, male and female, and, and by age as well. Uh, location is generally country, but, but there are also some, some sub-country estimates. Once we have the prevalence of the risk factor, we have the causes of death, we've quantified them. You can put those together and you can get the population attributable fraction. And then from those get, um, you know, why years life loss, years with disability, disability adjusted life years. So this is just my, my very uh, simplistic uh, 500 foot um, view of the, of, the, of the global burden of disease, just some of the steps here. It's a lot more simple that, than what actually happens. And I, I don't think I need to go into this too much. I think after Ashkan's talk, we can all acknowledge just the incredible complexity of this, of this process. <clears throat> so this is a, a figure that's taken from one of the GBD publications. A lot going on here. We're not, we're not gonna talk about all this. On the left side, uh, in, the, in the sort of reddish uh, area, we have the data sources. On the right side, we have the main outcomes here. We're looking at, at YLDs. In the middle, a whole lot of stuff happens. And this figure really may be for one risk factor or one group of risk factors. So when you talk about the whole Global Burden of Disease project, you have to imagine this figure and a bunch of figures next to it and then a bunch of figures behind it. Really, you have to kind of think three-dimensionally about uh, what's going on here? You have all these different risk factors. You, they're all interconnected. It's a very, very complex process, and I think I think we can all acknowledge that. I mean, just just from the the data perspective, over on the on the left hand side, just getting the data and, and finding a way that they can be uh, pooled together is very complex and, and requires a, a lot of a lot of assumptions. Um, uh, there's a lot of statistical modeling. So there, there was quite a few of the models that were mentioned in the previous talk and, and those are required to combine the data and then to fill data gaps. We're not gonna have uh, data at every location for every group and, and for every year. So we're gonna have to fill data gaps using those uh, statistical mo models. And there's gonna be a lot of assumptions all along the way. We're gonna have to assume things to try to simplify this, this process and those, are, Assumptions may be interconnected. So an assumption you make with, with vitamin A or, or iodine may impact you know, zinc or, or iron deficiency. So, uh, so the assumptions are, are gonna be interconnected with one another. So, so one of the key, start, key first steps is estimating the prevalence. Okay, so vitamin A, we need to estimate the prevalence of vitamin A. And that was talked about a lot in the previous talk about how they use vitamin A supplementation uh, data to do that. So one, one of the ways is so if you may look at this, you may say, okay, well, we, we start with some data. We put that data into a model. The model gives us different data. We add some more data to that. We model that. And then we kind of keep going down this line. So for example, we start with vitamin A supplementation data. We model that. That gives us something else. We add some vitamin A prevalence data. We model that and, and so on and so forth. So you may look at that and, and really uh, say to yourself, well, why, why so much modeling? Why do we need so much modeling? And this was a, a point that Ashkan talked on is the, is the sparseness of the, of the data that we have. Uh, so this is a, a figure uh, from an upcoming publication from uh, Ken Brown and his colleagues on uh, low and middle income micronutrient data. And we can see, uh, for example, for, for retinol and zinc that the data we have are, uh, are pretty sparse. So that there's, there's gonna be a lot of data gaps that, that need to be filled. Um, so it's a complex process. There's a lot of data gaps, which, which require a lot of statistical modeling, which, which is gonna result in, in uncertainty. So this, this figure here, this is not a micronutrient figure. This is something from my personal research estimating stunting prevalence, which is actually something we have a, a, a bit more data on. But it's um, what you see here is the, the blue line here is a, is a model-based estimate of stunting prevalence. Um, 
This takes into account the, the data points that you see, and you can see some uncertainty with those data points. And it takes into account some other factors, so uh, economic indicators, uh, those kind of things. For, for some countries here, you can see that we have a, a good amount of data, and, and for other countries, uh, we, we don't quite have as much. Um, uh, so this leads to uncertainty. There's uncertainty in the, the prevalence here of, of stunting, and that's represented by the, the blue shaded cone around the, uh, around the prevalence estimates. Okay, so, so why, why, why should we value uncertainty? What kind of role does, it, does uncertainty play? Well, first off, at times estimates above or below a certain threshold can, can have a major impact. When you think of the, the SDG, SDG goals, a lot of times they, they will boil down to, okay, you have to be above or below a certain point. So if we, if we look at Botswana here, maybe it's, let's say above or below 20%. The, the estimate is actually, you can see it's a little bit above 20%, but there's, there's so much uncertainty there, we really don't know. I mean, it very well could be less than, than 20%, and the uncertainty goes all the way down to uh, uh, 13% and up to, to 33%. So there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in the estimates here. Um, and really, it, it takes the thought process is to take it away from that yes, no, and to, and to take a two-dimensional perspective where we're, we're really acknowledging everything that's, that's going on here. The other case, Peru, which has a lot of data, we can say, okay, well, that's, that's obviously below 20%. We have a good estimate of that, and we have, we have small uncertainty with it. Uh, the, the uncertainty, what it really points to are, are gaps in the data. Um, there, there are places where we don't know uh, what's, what's going on as much, and and we really uh, are gonna need some, some more data for that. So the value of uncertainty is that it, it points us to places that we need data and that resources need to be allocated so that data goes to those, uh, to those places. Uh, the, the Global Burden of Disease Project really should be the greatest source of information for where data are needed. And this is not just for nutrition, for, for every, uh, every risk factor out there. And, I don't think it, it is currently. I don't think it's really used in that way that we really use this, uh, this project and the results from this project to, to, to tell us where the, the, the lack of information, where the data gaps are. So, so one thing I really wanted to, to do here was to advocate for the, the value of uncertainty, what uncertainty tells us and, and, and how to use it. Um, so, really to pay attention to what we don't know just, just as much as, as, as what we know. So we saw those ranks that were shown earlier. Yeah, that's the final estimate, but, but let's pay attention to, to what we don't know and, and where the uncertainty is. So this is a, a recent uh, figure from a recent presentation on, on vaccination coverage. And we see the top lines. We have figures that are showing areas that are, uh, have high or low vaccination rates. Uh, on the, the bottom figures, the blue and white ones, uh, blue, red, and white, excuse me, they have the, the width of the, un, of the uncertainty interval, larger width, more uncertainty. So really what I'm advocating for is to, is to pay as much attention to the, to the bottom set of figures where we're really demonstrating where the uncertainty is as the top set of figures. From the top set of figures, we can see, okay, well, in this top left region, we have uh, lower vaccination rates. On the bottom figure, we can see on the top right, wow, there's a lot of uncertainty there. and We, we really don't, don't know what's going on. That's where the data needs to go. So when we're thinking about how to move forward, uncertainty plays a big role. And really using uncertainty to, uh, to help us move research forward. The last thing I wanted to talk about was, was transparency. And this is one of my, my favorite Gary Larson uh, comics where you see this professor and a student um, at a blackboard and there's these complicated equations here on the left. And he says, a miracle occurs. And then he gets this great answer on the right. And the professor says, I think you should be more explicit here in, in step two. Obviously a joke, but transparency is, is something that's, that's very important. Here's a few of the models um, that were discussed some in, in Ashkan's talk, uh, some of the full names, some of the acronyms, uh, STGPR, Dismat Mr. Burt, CODEM. These are all models that are used in the process of, of completing the, the global burden of disease. 
So if you if you've read the the global, global burden of disease publications, a lot of the information will be in the supplementary materials, which which are vast. Um, there's usually multiple of them. Some of them will have extra tables. Some of them will describe more uh, uh, more thoroughly how how the estimates are obtained. These can be over a thousand pages long. And and personally, I've spent a lot of time with my nose in these uh, in these supplemental materials, really trying to figure things out. For the, for the 2019 global burden of disease, the supplemental material was, was vastly improved versus what, what was uh, previously in the, in the 2017, 2016 and, and previously. So they've, they've improved their documentation and their description of, uh, of, of what they're doing. So, so, so we're in a better place, but still there, there are times when really understanding the statistical methods is extremely difficult and sometimes not possible. Sometimes there's just not enough details to really uh, figure out what's, uh, what's going on. Um, for, for, for one of the commonly used methods, for example, the, the STGPR, there's really no peer reviewed publication that just describes that method and, and investigates the, the properties of that method. Um, the, the Mr. Burt method, I was gonna say the same about that, but they actually just, just came out with a publication describing that and showing the properties of that. So the, the, the transparency is, is really important. And I'm, here I'm talking about the statistical methods, which of course is, is gonna be my focus, but, but for you, it may be the data, how they use the data, where the data comes from and, and how it's cleaned. So the, there needs to be transparency in this. And what I'd like to advocate for is participating in the transparency. So not just looking at the results, but going and seeing how the estimates were made. If you don't understand it, okay, well, let's, let's email somebody and ask them. That will, uh, that will lead to an improvement in the, in the clarity of, of the description, lead to improvement in the transparency. If you do understand them, great. Then, then you really understand what's, what's going on and, and, and you can um, challenge that or, or, or take it. So, so to, to finish off here, uh, I'll go back to, to, to where I started. So, so the goal of this talk was to um, really discuss the, the way forward. How do we use the, the global burden of disease to, to move micronutrient research forward? And, and I think it's those three steps. It's acknowledging the complexity of the problem, valuing the uncertainty, and the need for uh, transparency and, and participating in uh, transparency. Um, this will help all of us. These are all about understanding. Okay? All these way forward things are all about understanding the process more completely. Help us understand what's, what's going on, what is the whole problem, what's happening on the inside, that's more the transparency aspect, and then what's coming out. And, and really, one of the things I really want to advocate for is don't just take that one dimensional look at an estimate, take the two dimensional look. Don't just look at the, the value, look at the uncertainty around it, because that part is, is really so, so key. And I, I think just being here is the first step, participating in a, in a webinar. And I think it's great that the Micronutrient Forum is, is facilitating a, a better process for all of us to understand uh, what's, what's going on. Uh, and with that, I'll give it back to Lisa. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. This is really wonderful. And, and you do, you highlight some of the, the true complexities behind the global burden of disease methodology. And, and that's why we really appreciate Ashkan and yourself so much for, for really breaking that down and, and clarifying a lot to us. And um, your thoughts and suggestions on the way forward are really helpful. So we look forward to reflecting on those a bit further later as well. Um, to bring it all together, though, for into a, a global perspective, it's, it's really my pleasure to welcome Sean Baker, who, who really needs no introduction at all, as he brings over 30 years of international public health and nutrition experience to us. And, and I think many of us know Sean from his days as at HKI, but he's worked for many, many other organizations as well. And um, Sean was, was actually one of the first directors of nutrition for the military. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and now he's serving as a chief nutritionist for USAID. So there he chairs the Agency for uh, Nutrition Leadership Council and oversees the vision and strategy of the Agency's Center for Nutrition in the Bureau of Resilience and Food Security, and he coordinates related efforts across uh, USAID. 
Um, and if that's not enough, he also guides the USAID's uh, investment and engagement with different partners to address malnutrition and uh, in developing countries. So we're, we're just really appreciative of all of Sean's work and we're glad to have him with us today. And we look forward to hearing about some of his insights um, on these uh, estimates. So over to you, Sean. Uh, thanks, Lisa, for that introduction. A huge thanks to Ashkan and Alex for walking us through something that is, for many of us who may be biostatistically challenged, incredibly complex. And I actually am probably going to build on the remarks of Saskia and Sonia in your opening uh, lakeside or fireside chat. And I'm going to actually start with a different sector, HIV, where I think in the early days of trying to fight the HIV pandemic, it really was very much a kitchen sink approach. And what revolutionized a, uh, controlling the pandemic was the rallying call of know your epidemic and know your response. And I think we've demonstrated here that in terms of deficiencies in essential vitamins and minerals, we've actually failed on both fronts. Um, and as Saskia, you had referenced, that comes out in the third Lancet series, which was launched uh, just last month of that the lack of data on micronutrient status is an unacceptable data gap. Um, and this has uh, really negative knock-on effects. I would posit if you compare how micronutrients are positioned in the World Health Assembly targets and SDG2 um, compared to where we were in 1990 with a real rallying call of virtual elimination of vitamin A deficiency, iodine deficiency, and reduction in iron deficiency anemia, we don't have that same rallying call and momentum. So um, I think we made a brilliant case of just how deficient we are in the basic data around essential nutrients. And speaking of, you know, I think people often look at me of, you know, how do uh, donors think uh, but I think sort of the way that investors writ large, be it a donor, like a bilateral donor or a philanthropic organization based in Seattle or a finance minister in any one of these high burden countries, I think there's a general uh, a, a similar thought process. You think of what is the magnitude of the problem? What are the known solutions to address the problem? What proportion of that problem can we solve with these known solutions? Is it feasible to deliver them? And what will it cost? So you got to know your problem, you got to know your solution set, and you've got to know the cost and the feasibility of going to scale. And really all of those answers reflect how certainly USAID tries to allocate resources, but I think USAID is a proxy for the way other investors look at how do you invest resources, be they donors, national governments, or, 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 or uh, other investors. Um, and, you know, reflecting back of one of the great successes, certainly of, well, I, I would say there've been two great successes in combating micronutrient deficiencies, uh, salt iodization and vitamin A supplementation. But vitamin A supplementation was a clear narrative based on multiple RCTs. Vitamin A deficiency is the cause of blindness and death. Supplementation can reduce death and almost virtually eliminate blindness, and we can do it at scale. That's an incredibly compelling narrative to investors. And you know, most people making these financial investment decisions, unfortunately do not have time to set through an hour and a half webinar to explain all the nuances. And so it's really our job to bring together the data in the most compelling and consensus-like way uh, because public disagreements on any burden estimates for any issue lead policymakers to find an excuse not to act, uh, you know, and the disagreements become the story instead of the problem we're trying to solve for. Um, I think in addition, and this is called out, and I think it's more and more uh, that there's a growing to demand to move beyond just national level, global and national estimates to breaking down then who is hit most, be geographically or by other population groups. And, and again, I'll quote the Lancet series of, you know, the some of the fundamental drivers of the burden of undernutrition are really inequity. And I think overall, there's a growing sense that we need to understand which groups are the most vulnerable and how do we address their needs. Um, I think a further dimension I would want to bring to the table here is the need in these estimates to differentiate 
what are changes due to some of the solutions going to scale and that if we took those solution sets away, we would actually be backsliding versus have there been fundamental changes in the background conditions that have permanently changed the burden, either hopefully to reduce the burden, but potentially to make it worse. And I say that because we sometimes get ourselves in a trap, and I think we've seen this before, um, that, for, for example, uh, the, the community that focuses on childhood blindness put out a publication, I don't know, a few years ago, uh, you know, celebrating the fact that vitamin A deficiency had virtually been eliminated as a cause of childhood blindness, but without an equally powerful statement to say, but that's because of the success of vitamin A supplementation programs. And there's nothing to suggest that if we uh, took our foot off the pedal of those vitamin A supplementation programs, childhood blindness due to vitamin A deficiency wouldn't resurge. And we've seen that in other areas of nutrition, certainly the number of countries that have made great progress in breastfeeding uh, rates, but then we let off the efforts to promote breastfeeding and it translates into backsliding. So we need to differentiate we can, what have been some structural fixes to the problem versus what are the fixes to the problem where we actually need to maintain that effort because otherwise we can really do ourselves damage. Um, I, I wanted to, to close to be a bit provocative here um, because Lisa, you said at the beginning we were being recorded, we needed to behave ourselves. And I know you met in a slightly different context, but I would posit that maybe that's part of our problem as nutritionists. We actually behave ourselves a bit too much. Um, you know, it is absolutely, and I think it's particularly relevant in this context. You know, I do think it is egregious that we still are losing almost 3 million children a year every year, every year to undernutrition. But I think it's particularly egregious that we still are losing so many people's lives and causing so many disabilities and so much suboptimal development due to micronutrient malnutrition. Because of all the challenges we're facing on the nutrition agenda, I think that probably deficiencies in essential vitamins and minerals are the most solvable part of the nutrition problem. Of course, we need to solve lots of other things in nutrition, but we certainly should be able to solve this. And if we do not uh, really start resolving these data gaps, we're just creating a vicious cycle of neglect of the micronutrient agenda. So really, uh, you know, congratulate the micronutrient forum and all the panelists for bringing this together because we do need better data. We do need to know our epidemic. We do need to know our responses and we need to hold ourselves and the world accountable so that we can really put an end to micronutrient malnutrition. Back over to you, Lisa. Great, thank you so much, John. That, that's been, that's really wonderful. And we appreciate you encouraging us to be more provocative is you're right. Sometimes we are a little bit to, too reserved and uh, we need to, to make sure that we, we stand for nutrition. And we thank you for constantly placing nutrition at the very high, top and, and very high level of the agenda. And so your, your perspectives and uh, have been very well um, taken and we really appreciate that. Um, so back to everyone, um, the question and answers have been um, picking up and we'd like to invite all the speakers back to engage in to another uh, panel discussion. We only have about 15 minutes left, but we'll make the most of those, those 15 minutes. Uh, there will be a little poll that will pop up onto your screen that we'd like all the participants to uh, to complete. And it's, it's really about how can we move the needle in data collection and management? Um, and, and what do you think are the most effective ways to do that? Um, so please go ahead and uh, complete that poll that's been popped up in your screen. And as people do that, we'd like to sort of ask um, Ashkan, you know, what he thinks that we might need to do in order to be able to move this uh, agenda forward um, quickly. Over you, to you, Ashkan. Sure, thanks. That's a great question. I think that I would say perhaps we need all of these to a different extent, and uh, there is perhaps not uh, essentially a single solution. So uh, one of our challenges is that we still don't have a very reliable method for assessing accurately dietary intake. They're still relying on self-reported data and self-reported data for dietary intake. We know that essentially is a lot of bias, either based on dietary recall, which we have a recall bias, or dietary record, which we see change the behaviors. We don't have essentially reliable information about micronutrient content of different foods across different nations. Food reformulation affect that. 
So that affects our understanding of the micronutrient uh, deficiencies as well. And also, uh, of course, uh, we need to, for many of the, even the gold standard method that we currently have, we don't have national representative surveys for many countries on dietary intake and biomarker levels. So I think that innovation and also political will needed for uh, to address uh, many of these uh, challenges. And I think, of course, to do those investment is also required. So I think my answer is that perhaps you need all of them. I agree. You know, we we the, not just uh, one method or one one avenue forward. I think is going to do it. We need multiple avenues, and we need multiple multiple partners to to move this forward. I think that that's very true. Um, Alex, um, I think I'm going to turn the next question over to you. Um, how do you account for the fact that reported coverage of vitamin A supplementation is taken from administrative data and is largely overestimated, as demonstrated by um, multiple um, evidence? That was one of the questions that came through on the Q and A. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. That's a that's a great question. Uh, how specifically that's that's done in the global burden of disease? I have no idea. So I'll, I'll say that right off the bat. But I, I I think it's a great question because there there are a lot of these issues. Uh, and this was, goes back to a conversation Sonia and I had when we first started doing this, where Sonia would say, I, I, "How can you estimate that? We don't have data for that. We should only use the data." Well, if we only use the data we have, we really can't say much of anything. So we always want to. We're trying to take data and we're trying to we're trying to stretch it out, use it the best we can. How I, I would think they would do it is they use data on what the relationship between those two are and take the data they have and then crosswalk it to something that they think is an unbiased estimate. I'm always fine with doing things like that as long as we're accounting for the uncertainty in that process. So really to me, that goes back to the uncertainty and making sure uncertainty is being propagated from, from one estimate to the, to the next. So I, I think I have to give that to Ashkan to actually answer the question. Okay, Ashkan, do you have any uh, further insights that you might be able to share with us on that? Sure, absolutely. I, I think that, uh, my, so there are two types of data that we use generally. The data either used as a covariate, which is a predictor, or uh, which uh, basically inform the estimates or as suboptimal data. And in the case of, uh, and where we do the crosswalk uh, that Alex mentioned. So in the case of vitamin A supplementation it is not data, it's basically covariate as I, as I mentioned. So the, what we do is that we generate the full time series of that. And then we generally use this as a predictor and as a covariate in the model. And uh, for where we don't have data, that covariate can inform our estimates along with other covariates. But where we have data, actually the data is used. The question is, what is the quality of the covariate? I think this covariate, given it's a covariate, we are not doing any crosswalk on that or any data adjustment. It's as good as the data that we receive. If we were using this as a data, then yes, we have had, uh, we should have done some uh, adjustment. But uh, I think the uh, one of the key question is that even if we want to do the adjustment for that, what is the alternative approach? What is the best data that we could have to do the adjustment? And the answer is that that's a apparently that's the best data that we have, and there's no other way to make the adjustment. So the data limitation is a factor here. In some countries, we may have some limited studies, but when we want to go at the scale, we need to see that what type of data reliably give us the highest coverage, both in terms of geographical coverage and time trend. And that's the type of data that is currently available to us. Great, thanks, Ashkan. And, and I think Alex is right. You know, I think we we do need to think about the the data gaps and and using GBD as as a way to to see where the most critical data gaps are. And I think uh, that would be a, a really nice exercise moving forward to 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 have a, a real call for for different data that can help improve the estimates. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, move over to to programs and and how programs use data. So maybe either, um, I think maybe Sonia, if you have any um, ideas about how um, programs have been improved or um, how data has been able to inform a different policy decision um, that you can think of. Yeah, I think one good example is um, the use of urinary iodine concentration and how that informed salt iodization and also the household coverage of iodized 
um, sold the IDA sold the use of it in different countries and how that has then informed either to in, in, improve the program, uh, try to find the problems, um, or in some countries like in Switzerland, where they um, adjusted the iodine content in the soil, realizing that it was possibly too low. So I think the data has been, you know, if it's used, if it's available, used, it can be incredibly important. Making yeah, I th that's program an safe. Example. And, yeah. yeah. It's, and, and I think even it's, it's going to be even more important as we go forward and we hear about all the, um, the NCD initiatives and reducing salt intake and making sure that we have the compatible uh, initiatives of making sure the populations are getting adequate iodine through salt, but yet the salt as the salt uh, intakes reduce, making sure the iodine is at an appropriate level. So using that as a good monitoring tool and things like that. So that, I think that's an excellent example. And I think also the work that the Global Alliance for Vitamin A is doing and trying to understand, you know, which countries need to continue on with their vitamin A supplementations and which countries might be able to have a more tailored approach to those programs um, that may not be ready to, to eliminate them altogether, but may have a, be able to target them better. I think they're really coming up with some good guidance on, on how to use data from the country, both on, you know, biomarker data and also intake data and, you know, ecological data and bringing that all together to help with their decision making. So I think, I think there's been some good initiatives in this area as well. Um, so that's very good. Um, I, we have another uh, question here and, and that's sort of like, if we start with the assumption that the biomarkers of micronutrient status are really the reference standard to define deficiency, but then we determine that there's no relationship between the dietary intake um, using the methods that we have um, generally applied to assess dietary intake and those biomarker levels. What real justification do we have for using the dietary data to estimate the prevalence of deficiency? So, so what is our sort of the assumptions that are going behind that? Um, and maybe this is this is back to Ashkan. Uh, I'm sorry for for. Uh, bothering you so much with these questions, but I think they're really important questions and, and maybe you can help us with that question too. Sure, that is a great question. And I think the key word here is that with the assumption that is the gold standard and not all the groups and not all stakeholders agree with that assumption. That's one consideration. The second thing is that when it comes to diet and micronutrients, only for few micronutrients we have essentially reliable biomarker. And uh, for others, we essentially, we don't have biomarker, reliable biomarker. And we know that when it comes to reliable biomarker, it needs to have a number of different characteristics. It needs to be sensitive to intake. It needs to reflect a specific time period. It shouldn't be ideally affected by other underlying conditions such as infections or other uh, factors. And many we consider this essentially uh, for only very few micronutrients, we have essentially a very reliable biomarker. The lessons that we have learned on the GBD side over the last decade, I think, is that essentially there is um, uh, no single method to assess nutrition uh, basically comprehensively. So the way that we have tried to operationalize is essentially get the picture from various perspective and also basically triangulate the result. And that's what we are doing. We are currently as a part of GBD, uh, uh, our team's establishing a machinery to estimate GBD, to estimate as much as possible from various perspectives, uh, both from uh, biomarker data and also from dietary intake. And also uh, so that we have both of them so people can compare and for different groups, there are different applications. But I think to answer uh, specifically this question is that uh, for some, I agree, for some of the uh, macronutrients that essentially argument can be made. And for those, we are trying to use them. But for others, the reliability of biomarker is questionable. And also the data availability of the uh, biomarker is also not great. And in those cases, we have two choices. Zinc is a good example. We should either stop est estimating the intake of zinc because there is no data, we should change the move them to the third category that I mentioned, or we should generate some level of estimate that at least work in terms of ranking the countries at risk. And by that, we can see at least which countries are at risk and start to work on them. And the third part is that the third argument perhaps for estimating the dietary intake is that at the end of the day, 
interventions comes from dietary intake and dietary intake. Uh, we need to have an idea of basically what countries, ideally we would like to have capacity building in improving nutrition through diet. And this dietary intake allows us to basically see countries that at least from that perspective as well. Okay, great, thanks. That's 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 really helpful. And and as we talk about the data and talk about data availability, I wanted to come back to a question that came early on in the in the symposium too about um, some of the micronutrient data that um, has um, is has been associated with the emergence of of you know some pandemics, so micronutrient deficiencies within the COVID nineteen pandemic that um, Saskia was was sort of alluding to in some of those questions that the medical world doesn't seem to be picking up on some of this data. And, and why do you think that is so? Um, I know that you, you um, gave some hints in, in your responses before, but I think maybe if you can um, come back to this question about data and, and how we need to make sure as a nutrition and community, we need to be collecting high quality data to be able to more rapidly respond to these uh, questions. Yeah, so I, I think, um, I thanks Lisa, I responded to that question uh, because um, we know that micronutrient deficiencies play an important role in the immune response and in general to resistance to infectious diseases. And as such, you can, uh, you can argue that adequate micronutrient status is important for, um, uh, for resilience against infectious diseases and resilience against future pandemics. Having said that, at the moment, you know, there is emerging evidence that some um, micronutrients, uh, particularly there's lots of research done on vitamin D, selenium, zinc, um, that they may play a role as well in the actual uh, prevention of severe COVID disease. But this evidence is still emerging. And I, I just think the evidence base is not strong enough yet uh, for, um, for medical practitioners to include this in, in treatment protocols. And, and, uh, and I think it's, it's right so. I, um, so, so I, I do agree that there is little attention in general, among medical medical practitioners, uh, about the importance of adequate micronutrient status for proper functioning of the immune system, so that's something that uh, that needs uh, needs work. Yet um, to link it directly to COVID, I think there the evidence is still too early. And in all of that, again, uh, yes, uh, having access to uh, adequate micronutrient data. Um, on population level, I, I think it's uh, is important to identify those at highest risk for these uh, for some of these micronutrients. Yeah, great, thanks, Saskia. I think that's really important. I think you know just really uh, being able to to be able to respond rapidly and making sure that we have the high quality RCTs you know out there for for the medical practitioners to be able to pick up. I think that that's. Yeah. Uh, Definitely, what's needed in the future, and so the last question I'd like to to pose to Sean, and and really to see if we can get a bit more of his reflections about some of the programmatics and programs and how they might be able to use some of the data that's being generated, whether it's their own data or whether it's something through the global burden of disease. How can programs and and countries forming policies use that data better? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Lisa. I actually also wanted to reflect on the question you posed to Saskia because I, I agree with Saskia that at this point the evidence to link micronutrient status to actual outcomes of COVID disease, I don't want to lead with that. I think what we need to lead with is the understanding that the pandemic is disrupting all the systems that are delivering nutritious diets, health services, etc. And so certainly micronutrient status is going to be one of the quickest things to suffer. And we need to make sure we're not backsliding on micronutrient solutions because we know they save lives and prevent disabilities, right? I, I don't want us to weaken our argument with evidence we don't have yet. But to your point, you know, I think what, I guess what I wanted to add and, and, and Sonia, you, you started this of what's the place of burden estimates. And I go back to HIV, know your epidemic, you know, we need to know our epidemic to see first, is it worth solving for? And how, how do we need to solve it? But from program management, we actually need to focus much more, are we delivering the solution set to the people who need it with a level of intensity and fidelity that's needed? And I think sometimes we miss those because at the end of the day, I'm not gonna manage my program towards vitamin A deficiency. I'm gonna manage my program towards coverage of fortified foods or coverage of vitamin A tablets or supplements, et cetera, for example. And I think it's important to make that distinction. And the, to me, one of the, 
a great breakthrough we've made here just in the last uh, year and a half as a nutrition community is get a much broader consensus on the effective coverage metrics and how do we make sure that we are managing towards that and that we can communicate one, that's how you adjust programs. And I think, as you said, the Global Alliance for Vitamin A has had a lot of good examples of how doing post-event coverage surveys, you can see who's covered, who's not covered, how do you adjust your programming in real time. You're not going to adjust your real programming in real time based on micronutrient status, which is not at all to dismiss the importance of the micronutrient status, but where is it in that you need it during that program design and implementation phase? Uh, so I think... And, but I also, I appreciate very much, uh, Alex, your point of one of the big, the beauties of the global burden of disease is making it really clear where are the data gaps and how do we prioritize it? We're not gonna be able to solve all of them at once, but I think it really gives a strong roadmap of how do we prioritize those data gaps and start filling them uh, progressively. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. So I, I wish we had more time because uh, there's lots of lots more to discuss, but I think this is a, a great uh, step forward and a big thank you to everyone for joining this uh, very first uh, Micronutrient Forum Reconnected webinar series. Um, just a big thank you to Micronutrient Forum for hosting um, us and for all those in the background who've also been allowed this webinar to run so smoothly. There's, there's many that you don't see that, that have been able to, to make this run smoothly, so thank you. Um, please do be on the lookout for additional information regarding different events that will come. Uh, these will be announced through the Micronutrient Forum social media platforms and also check out the uh, connected website for open access content from the speakers that presented today and also for much more further insight, we'll try and get some more answers to the great questions that were posed. So just thank you for a very interactive session and just a big thanks to all the speakers, you're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>